Okay, we'll now call to order the uh, Reno City Planning Commission meeting for Wednesday, December 21st. <clears throat> Can we get a roll call, please? Do you want to start with the pledge? That's it. I forget the order. Yeah, we'll start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Roll call second. Uh, yeah, perfect. Uh, Commissioner Armstrong, can you lead us in the pledge, please? Yes. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and thank you for catching me. Uh, can we have a roll call, please? J.D. Draculich? Here. Harris Armstrong? Present. Peter, Peter Gower? Here. Mark Johnson? Here. Arthur Munoz? Here. Sylvia Vill Villanueva? Here. Alex Felto? Here. We have a quorum. Great, thank you. Uh, we'll now move to agenda item number three, which is public comment. This item is for either public comment on any action item or for any general public comment. Do we have any request to speak forms? Let me just state my, state my statement one real quick. It should be noted for those in the audience that comment, comments are to be addressed to the Planning Commission as a whole. Comments heard under this item will be limited to three minutes per person and may pertain to matters both on and off the Planning Commission agenda. Please note that the Planning Commission may not take action upon any matter not agendized for possible action on today's agenda. When you are called on for public comment, please state your name for the record and begin speaking. The timer will begin when you say your name and you will be afforded three minutes. If you are an attendee in the Zoom meeting and would like to make public comment at this time, please raise your hand. Lastly, while in this room, please, please be respectful. Warnings will be issued by the <clears throat> warnings will be issued by the presiding officer if there is disruptive behavior, and you will be asked to leave chambers if the behavior continues. We did receive correspondence uh, that was not related to anything on tonight's agenda. I did not receive any voicemails, but I do have a request to speak for. Great, thank you. Is the uh, councilwoman is request speak form for you, or please come on up? Hello, I'm Councilmember Megan Ebert. I was just coming in to introduce myself. I'll be the new liaison. I just wanted to say hello and meet everyone. So, hi. That's it. Thanks for coming. Would anyone else in the public like to speak? Okay, seeing none, we'll close public comments. We'll move to item number four, which is approval of the minutes for the regular, for the November 17th, 2022 uh, Reno Planning Commission meeting. Do we have a motion? Uh, Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. You have a motion? Commissioner. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Wainova? I was going to second the motion. Great, we have a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any Aye. opposed? Okay, the motion carries unanimously. <clears throat> Uh, the agenda allows us to take items out of order, uh, and as such, we're going to move the training series after the public hearings portion. So we'll jump to item number six, which is public hearings, and we'll open up the public hearing on 6.1, which is case number LDC 23-00023455, Crampton Street Master Plan and Zoning Map Amendments. Do we have a presentation tonight? Good evening, uh, Planning Commission, uh, Chair, Chair People, <laughs> Chairperson. Uh, it's, is it? I can't, there's a bow over your name, so I'm not able to see your name. The red bow in the front there. It's actually my name is Bo. It's Bo. <laughs> no, it's, uh, Belto, I appreciate Alex. It. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Jeffrey Lofton with Dixon Realty, uh, in behalf of the applicant. Uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for the work that you guys do and. This is really fun to watch, especially being the only one on the agenda tonight. So I'll try to make this brief and, and also fun. Um, uh, we have here a, uh, a site on Crampton Street, which has been vacant for some time. But, but prior to that, prior to this, this most recent purchase, was utilized as a HVAC office and also a sign shop. Um, and so uh, as, a, as a property manager, I, I manage some things in this area, and then also there's been a lot of activity in this area just for kind of redevelopment. Um, with proximity to the VA here, 
we're seeing that there are a lot of people that want affordable housing close to the VA. And so that being a great need still, um, we're looking for opportunities to do that. So I uh, just want to just give a, a grateful word with regards to uh, the new city code, which allows for a density bonus in some of these MF14 and MF30 zoned areas. That's really been, you know, one extra unit in a lot of these homes means means a lot, means, means sometimes as many as three or four vets that can comfortably be housed close to the VA. And so uh, that is working, and I just wanted to applaud that that, that uh, new provision under the city code that, uh, and those are, those are units that are designed by nature to be affordable, right? Under a thousand square feet. Um, many times these are dual occupant rooms, um, but this isn't, this isn't someone who's, uh, this developer actually owns an HVAC company himself uh, and is doing this project with a few other young contractors. And so they purchased this property and we began kind of doing some research on best, highest and best use for density there close to the VA. So, um, this is a street view. You've got the Sinclair station. You can see at the top of the photo, just off of Wells. And then as you come here at the bottom of the photo would be east with the VA just about 100 yards behind us. Um, and the way this is laid out, uh, north to south, it's it's one continuous lot and, and we're not discussing a lot line adjustment or anything of that nature, but we just kind of noticed that with the, uh, the multi-story uh, developments closer to Wells in that, that Wells uh, planning area, that neighborhood plan allows for density and calls for density, in fact. In fact, there is a need for additional services. I mean, we see the potential for, certainly for affordable housing here and potentially ground floor services. We wanna make sure that that parking paradigm works for everyone and that the, the walkability is, is high and good, but really and truly this particular uh, individual who's, who's asked me to work on this zoning change uh, is focusing on affordable housing. So certainly we'll, we're open to in development uh, the idea of additional services here. But what is most most interesting is the fact that we were really limited to, because of our lot size, a maximum of maybe uh, three units. And coming in and, and talking with staff extensively, what we found is that this lot was designated as a, a mixed-use lot under a prior version of the plan. So this is kind of in keeping with that whole that whole idea. Um, so we can see that the neighbor just to the west there has already has divided north to south and has future development potential there. And we're seeing a lot of good make sense projects that are that are creating additional units in this area. And this is this is becoming kind of an extension of uh, affordability in Midtown, where we we're seeing those those rents really peaking. Uh, just two years ago, we're seeing them on the way back down now here on the east as you move east from Midtown. So this is a great, this is a great area. You know, tenants in that area also include uh, postgraduate students, you know, first uh, first career professionals. Um, and it's been a really, it's, it's really vibrant. Uh, the walkability is very good. And we're seeing uh, additionally that a whole segment of, uh, you know, pensioners, essentially guys that, that are living, uh, you know, in, in uh, multifamily, scenarios uh, and so we'd love uh, love to have your support on this master plan amendment that would allow us to go past just that two to three unit density and I think what we're looking for here is probably we understand a structure that's obviously in keeping with the neighborhood but we can't even really enter into design considerations beyond that three units without the change right so that's why we're here um, there is a that's really the most fun photo gentlemen uh, all right. So, if there's any questions, I'd love to I'd love to hear them and uh, or any comments that I might be able to respond to. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll we'll probably call you up for comments or questions after. Grace, do we have a presentation? Yes. Good evening, commissioners. Um, Jeffrey did a great job of giving you an overview of the project, and so I'll try to just fill in the gaps, um, cover some of the more technical items. And this is for 455 Crampton Street Master Plan and Zoning Map Amendments. So the subject site is about 0.16 acres in size. It's located in that Midtown area next to the VA, VA hospital, west of that hospital, um, just north of Crampton Street and east of Wells. So the applicant is requesting a zoning map amendment from multifamily 14 units per acre to general commercial and a master plan amendment from mixed neighborhood to suburban mixed use. So the subject site is also within that Wells Avenue neighborhood plan with a Wells Avenue mixed use sub plan. These are not proposed to change with this application and I think they're actually pretty important to the application. 
the master plan request is to go from mixed neighborhood to suburban mixed use. So you can see here it's um, abutting that suburban mixed use to the west. And SMU or suburban mixed use is primarily intended to support a diverse mix of commercial and residential uses, while MX is really intended for, intended for lower density, single family detached and duplex dwellings. The subject site has been operating as commercial and it's also identified as mixed use within the Wells Avenue neighborhood plan. So I think this is probably the most important thing that when staff was analyzing this project, we found that the existing Wells Avenue neighborhood plan that was adopted in 2008 matches what's proposed. So it's specifically carving out this parcel. Additionally, in our master plan, the Wells Avenue neighborhood plan calls out conforming base zoning districts and master plan districts based on the neighborhood plan. So since this is within the Wells Avenue mixed use designation, the SMU is the only conforming district for that overlay. The applicant is also requesting a zone change from multifamily 14 units per acre to general <clears throat> commercial. General commercial is generally more consistent with that mis mixed use master plan and it allows for them to do commercial as well as residential development. So this will bring the existing non-conforming commercial operations into conformance. Here is a Google Street View. You can see that newer residential development to the west of the site. There is a uh, residential project to the east and then there's that Sinclair station and vacant lot as well to the west. Here's a summary of the findings, or sorry, here's a comparison of the development standards for multifamily 14 units per acre and general commercial. I think the biggest change we'll see here is general commercial is more permissive with zoning standards and um, development standards as well as the allowed uses. However, that Wells Avenue neighborhood plan has some provisions to limit things like height um, and some of those uses as well. Here are the findings for a zoning map amendment. The project is consistent with state law and it conforms with the new master plan as well as many of our existing master plan policies. Here are the findings for a master plan amendment. Staff recommends approval. The recommended motion is on your screen and I'm available for questions. Thank you very much. <clears> okay, <throat> hey, we'll come back to the commission for disclosures. We'll start with Commissioner Gower. Thank you, Commissioner Gower, no disclosures. Commissioner Munoz, no disclosures. Commissioner Armstrong, no disclosures. Commissioner Draculich, I visited the site, read and received emails, and also spoke briefly with the applicant's representative. Commissioner Johnson received and read emails. Uh, Commissioner Velto, same disclosures. Oh, sorry, Commissioner Villanueva. Uh, Commissioner Villanueva, I visited the site and I read two emails. Great, thank you. <coughs> okay, we'll now open up uh, public comment. Heather, do we receive any requests to speak forms? We did not receive any requests to speak forms or voicemails, but we did receive correspondence that was distributed to the commission uh, before tonight's meeting. Great, thank you. Uh, would anyone in the public like to speak? Seeing none, we'll close public comment. Uh, come back to the commission for questions of the applicant or the staff. Commissioner Villanueva has questions for the planner. Please. That's Hi, Grace. Hi. Um, quick question. Well, a couple quick questions for under the um, for the zoning map amendment. What was why? Why did um, the city decide? Or maybe it wasn't the city. Maybe it was the applicant. But the what was the decision to use uh, GC rather than NC? General commercial versus NC. Why? What was the basis for that decision? Yes, so I will go back to our zoning map amendment. Um, it's more consistent with the surrounding area. So we see general commercial um, with the surrounding. And I know with this Wells Avenue neighborhood plan, um, this was very intentional to have these higher intensity zones closer to Wells Avenue. Um, and then it kind of taper out towards that MF 14 area. So general commercial gave them kind of what they were looking for with uses allowed and density. Um, and it's consistent with the area. We see general commercial surrounding the site. So other than the abutting of the GC next to it, I think from my review, NC and GC 
both allow for multifamily 14 and, and above. Isn't that right? Yes, correct. And typically with these, we will try to go to what's around the site so that we don't have, um, you know, I guess, a random zoning that allows similar things within that area. Um, and also I think general commercial is just a little bit more permissive. Can you give examples of, so for, so some of the examples I found in the differences is not that it applies to this case, but my, I guess the reason I'm even raising these questions is because I'm concerned about slippery slope and us creating this precedent where it just keeps going down and down into the neighborhood and then we wreak havoc on the neighbors. And so some of the examples that I, the reason I'm concerned about GC versus NC is in, in GC, it allows for funeral parlor, whereas NC does not. Um, both allow for multifamily. Um, GC is more broad and allows for more um, general uses. And I'm concerned about it just kind of really just there being that slippery slope where it really starts to go into the neighborhood. And I, I don't know, um, I just, uh, I don't know what other examples as to other than the abutting that really a, makes sense for a GC versus an NC. Do you have any? Yeah. Or is it I, really, go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't no, interrupt. No, no, sorry. I think the biggest thing when staff was looking at this project was this Wells Avenue neighborhood plan. Um, and so, as I had said, this was adopted in 2008. Uh, and this specifically calls out just this site. So it does call out this site, not any other sites. And so if we were to get, a, you know, a whole block trying to come into um, a GC zoning district, that would be a lot harder for staff to make these findings. This was intentionally, thoughtfully um, carved out in this Wells Avenue neighborhood plan as being commercial and being mixed use. Um, and so that was what staff was able to feel comfortable with that zone change. And also I will bring it, you know, any future development adjacent to residential is still going to need to go through that discretionary review. So some of those more intense uses in general commercial will be able to put some parameters on them. Um, and Wells Avenue does this as well. I mean, there's some prohibited uses that were attached in that staff report that, that this neighborhood plan really went through and thought, okay, you know, we don't want some of these more intense uses, so how can we place some bumpers on that? Um, and so I think through those processes, it, it, it makes staff feel comfortable that with that general commercial zoning. Okay, thank you. That's all, uh, Chair. Thank you, Commissioner Villanueva. Any other questions or discussion? Or a motion? Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion. Please. Um, in case number LDC 23-00023455, Crampton Street Master Plan and Zoning Map Amendment, based upon compliance with the applicable findings, I move to adopt the Master Plan Amendment by resolution and recommend that City Council approve the Master Plan and Zoning Map Amendment subject to, con to conformance review by uh, the Regional Planning Commission. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Commissioner Draculich, I second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, the motion carries unanimously. Thank you and good luck with your project. Merry Christmas. <clears throat> okay, since we took the uh, item number five, or we took item number six out of order, we'll go to item number five, which is the Planning Commission Training Series uh, from the American Planning Association, a video presentation on staff reports and discussions. I'll turn this over to you, Jason. Thank you. Uh, good evening, Commissioners. Jason garcia Labu, Planning Manager for the Record. Um, we have about a half hour video um, and it will go through, it's uh, put out by the American Planning Association and it's going to discuss some um, basics and a general overview of staff reports. And then after the video, I have a couple comments and discussion items that I expect to bring up. So with that, we'll go ahead and jump into the video when we're ready.
Hello, I'm Michael Blue, and we're here today talking about how to build a better staff report. I'm here with Bonnie Johnson from Kansas University, and uh, we're going to start by just talking about, Bonnie, why is the staff report important? Maybe you've got a story or an example that tells us. Um, well, a staff report is important to a planning commission because it's the background information, the um, analysis that the planning commission needs to really evaluate an application and make a decision, make an informed decision of to approve, deny, approve with conditions or continue to a future meeting a particular application. Um, for myself, I was a practicing planner for eight years and wrote tons of staff reports. But then later on, um, when I went back to graduate school to get my PhD, I became a planning commissioner in my own community of Lawrence, Kansas. And so it was really when I became a planning commissioner and all I had to rely on were those staff reports that I really started to understand why they're important and, and how a planning commissioner uses them. And so I was a graduate student working on my dissertation. And so like many planning commissioners, didn't have a lot of time and so I would read the staff reports often than, you know, I have to say the night before the meeting and try to figure out what's going on. And I found that, you know, I'm no longer immersed in the city's comprehensive plan. I no longer know the zoning ordinance inside and out. And so I had to rely on that staff report. And I just felt like there was, the rest of the story was missing um, and I would then come to the planning commission meeting and feel like I don't, I don't really know what's going on. And I thought, you know, if myself being a former planner, I'm struggling to really understand what's the right thing to do. What's the amateur planner who really doesn't know about planning. What's it like for them? So that creates a situation where the staff report's got to cover a lot of ground, yet it's got to do it efficiently and make it easy to read. And I spent a little bit of time as a plan commissioner as well, and I know that you get that packet and you open it and you're excited to see what's going to happen, but you're kind of hoping it's not that long because there's a lot going on. So we'll, we'll cover some ground on how to find that, that balance point. But so maybe we could start by talking about what makes a good staff report, right? So what, uh, what should always be in one and how do you distinguish between a good one and one that's not so good? Okay, um, well, and I should say that how I've, I've come up with this, what makes a good staff report is after reading uh, uh, over 250 staff reports from all across the country and from little towns and big cities. Um, so I have, I have put in my time <laughs> with staff reports. And what I found most useful and what seemed to work really well is it's essential to have a cover page. And not just any cover page. The cover page should be that essential information that a planning commissioner needs that, you know, if they don't read anything else, they have that. And, um, and so that cover page should have some kind of background information, the property owner, the location, maybe even a small location map, you know, where this application is in the city, um, and kind of information on the, the property, the land use, the surrounding land uses. But then the really good cover pages also have a small summary of what is this application all about. And then the other ones that are really good have the recommendation on the cover as well. Um, and so, you know, it's really is here's the pertinent information and uh, then the rest of the staff report fleshes that out and gives more information. But you've got that good cover page that, you know, covers the bases. Um, also what makes a good cover page is there might be things that your particular planning commission is interested in. Um, like the arterial road fee or uh, floodplain, and maybe that goes on the cover as well because you know the Planning Commission's always going to be interested in that. So we know that staff reports are going to vary. Yes. What they include, how long they are, all that. But the idea of a cover page that's there 
if somebody doesn't have the time to read the whole thing, or if during the meeting they want to go back and kind of catch up on something they didn't remember. Right. That cover page is key. It's a real tool for the commissioner. Yeah. Great. Yeah. And I've even seen one cover page where the, the staff put a uh, proposed motion as well. So really, just think about that as what's the essential information for the Planning Commission, their cheat sheet, in other words. Um, and then you can start getting into um, more details, particularly the analysis of how does this application fit into the future plans of the community? I mean, that's really the heart of why we're doing these staff reports is what does this mean for the community? And we have these plans of what we want to be in the future. How does this application fit in with that? That's and great. So set some of the context. It's not just a building on a site. So I think that's essential for the staff report to do. Um, but then maps, maps, maps. <laughs> <laughs> um, that you can uh, show a lot with a map of you know where this is, what's the context, um, and photos. I mean, it used to be that it was a big deal to put a photo in a staff report, um, and you even had to go and take slides to show a slide at the, the meeting. Well, now, digital cameras, camera on your phone, you can go out to the site, look around, take photos, take photos of the surrounding area, things that are pertinent, and then put that into your staff report. And that can, you know, those sorts of photos and maps can save you a lot of words um, and help people understand what you're talking about. You're talking about erosion in the, the floodplain, well, show it. Um, the planning commissioner can then see, oh, that's what they're talking about. That does look like that's a problem. Um, so maps, photos, and then putting it into um, easy to navigate format. So have a template where you know the usual information is in the usual places, maybe tables that show how does this meet our arterial road impact fee? Um, does this impact schools? What neighborhood association is this in? Kind of those sort of checklist things that you can put in a table and those are always in the same place. And, and over time a staff member will learn you know the Commission always asks about this or this has been an issue in the community or last time we talked about it so making sure that that's in there and easy to find almost as, as a checklist or a checkbox. Yeah okay. and that's good for the, the Planning Commission so the Planning Commissioner that's really interested in uh, schools and they wonder, well, did the planners really check on the impact of schools? They can see, oh, yeah, they did check. Um, so that's, that's helpful to have that in there. Um, and then you can do things to help make it easy to navigate, like I say, those tables that can be almost like checklists, and then um, have sidebars that have educational information. Um, if the commission hasn't dealt with the tree ordinance in a while, well, you can put in that sidebar, here's our tree ordinance, here's why it's important. We started it in 1992 when the beloved cottonwood tree in the middle of town was cut down. I mean, you can kind of educate people with those sidebars as well. And then um, use a box or highlight things to show this is really important. Um, some uh, communities on their staff reports put the recommendation in a box. So it's always easy to find and just make it easy to navigate. Let me go to something we were going to talk about a little later, but you mentioned a few times the recommendation in a staff report. Mm -hmm. um, not every staff report has a recommendation. Not every town likes or wants there to be a recommendation in a staff report. Maybe you can talk a little bit about what you found regarding when and why staff reports have recommendations and maybe some of the pluses and minuses. I, as a practicing planner, had always worked for a community that they wanted a recommendation. So when I started doing research around the country, I ran into communities that they didn't have the recommendation in the staff report. And I then would call up the planner and say, what's going on here? And they would say, oh, our planning commission doesn't want us to put a recommendation in there. And I thought, oh, wh what's going on with that? And it really is that the Planning Commission, they, they are the ones making the decisions. And some of them don't necessarily want 
um, that recommendation ahead of time that would color their thoughts. I mean, they really want to make the decision themselves. Um, and it also makes it clear to citizens, the applicants, this is the planning commission and then the city commission or city council making the decision. We, we are in democracies and it's, it's other citizens making the decision. It's other citizens telling the property owner, this is what you can and can't do with your property. It's not a bureaucrat or staff saying that. It's other citizens. And that's, there's something really powerful in that as well. Um, I can see the, the flip side to that is the planner is sitting there saying, I think about this all <laughs> the time. Yeah. I often have a master's degree. I, I, you know, I know the plan inside and out. I make it my business to really know the community and I want to share that information with the planning commission through a recommendation and really share my expertise. So I can see from the planner's point of view that, you know, and many planners go into the profession because they want to help. <laughs> and so there's, let me help you, let me give you my expertise. Um, but it's really going to be each community figuring out how they want to to use the expertise of their planners, how that would be shared, that sort of thing. So there's no right or wrong. There's yeah. not you have to have or you can't have. Right. It's it's a local preference that develops over time. Right. Maybe something that it's worth the planners having a discussion with the staff, with, with the um, uh, with the their elected officials or their plan commission or maybe their administration. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so let's go back to staff reports mm -hmm. and let's talk about what you talked about. Some of the things that make for a good staff report. What are some of the pitfalls that you've seen looking at all those staff reports um, that, that you think people should avoid? Um, well, one of the big pitfalls is no maps or maps that really aren't helpful. I mean, there's some maps that, that they'll show the location of the, the site and it's so zoomed in that it's a building and that's it. And if you're not really familiar with the community or that particular location, that map's not going to help you very much. Um, and it seemed like a lot of the staff reports would have a, a map of that particular location, but not where it was in the city. So having a map of where it is in the city um, is, a, is a good thing to help people you know, visualize it. Um, also, no photos. Um, just to be able to give people a, a, a visual idea of what's going on in case they haven't been able to go out and look for themselves. Um, so no photos is an, an issue. Uh, repetition. Uh, we kind of as planners get into, well, we've got the background and then here's our analysis. And then we, in the analysis, go over the background again. And so we're repeating ourselves over and over again. And that just makes it to where there's so much that a planning commissioner has to wade through, and then they're starting to gloss over things because, oh, yeah, 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 you told me that. So trying to be efficient with that sort of, of information is, is key so that you're not just repeating yourself over and over again. Um, I think in trying to be create this legal foundation for decision making, uh, planners often just dump information into a staff report. They just they put in everything, including the kitchen sink, and it's just it's too much. Um, you know, a planning commissioner is trying to be very d diligent, and they'll get this 80 to 100 page staff report, and like, oh, do do I have to read it all? Yes, every bit of it. <laughs> and and they might give it a good try. But then the whole point of the staff report gets lost in all of that information. Um, so just that being very efficient and not just throwing everything in. Uh, remember the point of the staff report. We're trying to get across information to the Planning Commission so they can decide what's in the best interest of the community. So keep coming back to that and focusing on that and that should help you um, cut down on the repetition. You mentioned the 100-page staff report. Is there a right answer for how long a staff report should be? Is there a too long or a too short? Um, you know, I do wonder about the 80 to 100-page staff reports. Is is it really is that really helpful or not? 
um, because you do always have the file as your your kind of foundation for the the report. Um, my uh, colleague and I uh, have done a, uh, a study of staff reports and we've looked at, uh, we created a, a, a staff report evaluation tool where we just listed the traditional things that are in a staff report and then some modern things that go into staff reports and some uh, modern ways of formatting a staff report. We took that tool and evaluated staff reports from across the country. And we discovered that uh, lots of pages didn't necessarily mean that the staff report hit those items on our evaluation tool. We found that the ones that seemed to do a good job of hitting kind of the traditional items, property owner, um, do they have street access, kind of those traditional things that you would have in a staff report. And then the ones that would do some formatting, uh, things like having tables, um, having photographs, things like that. Um, those sorts of reports, they fell between five and 10 pages. So kind of eight pages on average was what you needed to have good coverage, but then also have your maps and your photographs. Because maps and photographs and tables are gonna take up more room they're gonna add pages. So don't be afraid of, oh my gosh, we're getting to 10 pages. Well, part of those 10 pages are some great photos, some great graphs that are gonna help people understand what's going on. And, and what, what about the, um, the importance of a consistent layout, right? So that as I get, if I'm a commissioner, if I get a report meeting to meeting, it kind of looks the same or there's that same structure. Um, have you found there's benefit to that? It really does help a planning commissioner know, um, you know, I'm always interested in floodplains. Let me turn right to that. I'm going to look at that. I had a, a planner talk about thinking about a staff report as not something that you're going to read from beginning to end. Think of it as sort of like a, a web page that you're going to click around for what you find most important. If you have that consistent uh, layout and consistency in where you're putting certain information, then a planning commissioner can, in essence, click around to what they find most important. So for the planner that's preparing the staff report, um, you had said earlier that planners got into this, they want to help, they want to show um, the, the insights that they've shared. What's, what's the role of the planner? So as they prepare the staff report, are they the facilitator? Are they the scribe? Are they the advocate? What, what role do they play in this whole process? I think that particularly with staff reports, um, planners can kind of get into the, the facilitator or processor role that I'm the person who's accepting the application, I'm reviewing it, I'm getting the report done, and that can start to appear very bureaucratic and kind of be off-putting but I think that when planners think of their role as actually I'm an advocate for the community, that that can really breathe life into staff reports. Um, you know, coming back to why is this important? Um, what difference does this make to our community? And it's not necessarily being an advocate for the developer or an advocate for or against the application necessarily but it's an advocate for the community. Um, this is what our plan says is important for us to do. Um, and nowadays, so many communities do regular surveys. And so you even know what your community's priorities are based on surveys. And so the planner knows the community and can really be that advocate for the community. I also think that um, staff reports can help planners lead. Um, it's, an, it's a new thing with the American Planning Association to focus on planners as leaders. And um, that's an uncomfortable role for some planners. We're, we actually are very dedicated to that the, the, the planning commissioners, the city council, those are the leaders and, and we help them. Um, but we can help them by also leading, um, putting out suggestions, those good ideas that we run across in other communities or that the American Planning Association brings to our attention. We can put those into staff reports to say, um, 
uh, it sounds like that in the past we've struggled with tree preservation. Um, that's essential to this application as well. If you're interested in changing the ordinance, here's some things we're thinking about, and we could have a future study session on that. And I think that's a terrific point because I know a lot of planners, when, write, when we write staff reports, we're a little concerned about saying the city needs to do this, the city needs to do that, um, and that that can appear a little bit out of place. But the idea of saying, if the city council is interested or if the commission is interested, here's what you might want to do. We used to say, should the council consider adopting this, even though maybe the staff thought it wasn't, here are some conditions you might think about adding to it. And the, the, the planning commission and the city council might decide, you know, no, we, you know, tree preservation, not so important. And that's okay. But the, the staff is still putting that out there. Um, and, and it's also, these staff reports, if you think about them, they are the regular way that planners communicate with their planning commission and their city council month after month after month. And if that's your main communication tool, I mean, really use it to your benefit and add in that additional information, that educational information um, that really takes advantage of your expertise. A staff report doesn't just include the work of the planning department or the community development department. There are other departments that are involved in the development process. Uh, what are some good ways or some things that you've seen in your, in your work uh, regarding how other departments become part of the process? And that's the important to remember that the staff in staff report isn't just the planner. Um, it's the staff, it's public works, it's parks and recreation, it's police, it's fire. Um, what I always enjoyed when I was a practicing planner was that meeting, that plan review meeting where the representative from the fire departments there, police, building inspections, code enforcement, we're all there looking at these applications and then I'm taking all of their information and putting it into my report. And so to be able to, to have that in the report to show it's not just me, the planner, saying this. Staff is, is saying whether this is a good idea or not. It's also that you as a planner can't know everything. I mean, you, you really need that expertise of, of the engineer or the building inspector that's been there for years um, and just bringing that all to the table. And so in a staff report, you can have um, you know, a checklist where it has the comments from the other departments or comments even from other agencies like the Department of Transportation, things like that. Um, and you might have to decide uh, how much to leave that into the main body of the report or how much to perhaps put that in an appendix or attachments. Um, but you can always direct people if you want to look at the utilities uh, comments on this application, see page 20 uh, in the attachments or something like that. Part of the zoning approval process is, are the standards that the community has against which to consider a variation or a special use. Um, how do you find that those are incorporated and incorporated well into a staff report? I think those things can particularly come into play when you're um, writing your recommendation and you're justifying that re uh, recommendation. You're saying, here's, you know, we're recommending approval, here's why. Um, and really coming back to that, um, that it's not just the planner making these things up, it's there are concrete reasons why the recommendation is the, the way that it is. Um, and then also coming back to, again, why this is important. Why is this important to the community? Um, it's important to the community because we have these, these regulations, we have these plans. We've decided in the past that this is important for us, and then here's how with this application we're meeting those expectations or not. And sometimes um, a zoning case can end up in, in litigation. Um, and how, how does the staff report play a role in that or should it or should we always be anticipating that there may be litigation or is that something that maybe is just in the background and not necessarily a main concern with a staff report? 
I, I think that that concern that any application at any time could become a court case yeah. <laughs> is what makes it to where planners just dump a ton of information into the staff report. Um, I think if you kind of think about, um, well, we have a template where it's helping us remember everything and, and, and again, show that, well, we checked this, we checked with public works, uh, we checked with our ordinance. I mean, that that's all in there um, and that you're trying to, with the staff report, be fair. I think that um, a good template where you can make sure you've covered your bases and maybe do it with a check mark versus a ton of text and then, you know, always coming back to, well, is this fair? I think then your staff report is going to serve you well if you go to court. And then also, um, again, having a, a good record in your file of what uh, your correspondence with the applicant, things like that, that's your backup. So we've talked a lot about staff reports and I'm sure everybody who's listening is now turning through their staff reports to see how they did. Any suggestions for how somebody might go about evaluating their staff report or the way they've been doing it? Um, well, one thing you can do is, is um, the staff report evaluation tool that um, myself and Ward Lyles with the University of Kansas put together, um, we have that available. And it really is just a tool to evaluate. It's not even good or bad. It's just here are all these different things you could have in your staff report and so take your staff report, go through the, the items on the, the, the tool, and then decide for yourself, your community, oh, do we also need to add that in? Or, oh, that would be a good way to format that. Um, so you can use that. I also think using your planning commission as a focus group, um, even just having at a study session a discussion about the staff reports. What do you like? What do you not like? Um, what comes to mind when you hear the word staff report. Just kind of having that discussion is useful. You can also, I would say, go back to a staff report for a case that maybe had a split vote or was controversial. Take that staff report, rewrite it in three or four different templates, three or four different formats or ways of presenting the information and uh, have the planning commission look at that and then say, okay, you know, did, does this change anything? Is this more helpful? And they might say, well, I, I like the way you presented the background information in template number two, but the way you did the analysis in template number three, I really like that. And so it gives the planning commission something to, to uh, respond to in some different examples and options. Um, and then you can re, kind of redo the staff report with that input from the planning commission. I think that's great advice. You know, staff reports are always written on deadline. Yes. And okay. that, that can really that can really be a challenge. And so the things you've talked about in terms of uh, kind of systematizing and um, the checklist and that I think can really help people. But what you're suggesting too is that don't get stuck in that as a format. You end up relying on that and going, oh, I don't have to start till Wednesday. Yeah. But to keep it kind of a living document or a living effort using your plan commission, I think is great advice. Well, and since you're often doing those staff reports every month, you know, try something different. One month, do this, the staff reports this one way. See how the planning commission responds. See how the public responds. Next month, try something else um, and just see what what happens, what people like, what they respond to. Great advice. Well, I want to thank you for, for taking the time and sharing your insights and your research and uh, helping us help people build a better staff report. Well, you're very welcome. Um, and staff reports are so important um, that we shouldn't forget about them. Agree. Thank you. So, uh, Jason Garcia Labu, for the record again, planning manager. Um, I wanted to just follow up to that uh, conversation. Um, I know it was half an hour, but it really touches on some very important points. And I just want to reinforce that uh, staff is really here to support the commission 
uh, to help provide you the materials and the documentation that you need to make your decisions. And so as part of that, um, we really make a conscious effort to tell the story, the who, what, where, why, when, how, to our best, to the best of our ability, what facts we have that have been presented with the application. And as part of that process, we really make an effort to work closely with an applicant to kind of hash out some of those issues, uh, look closely at the code, um, find out problematic areas, and maybe even work with the applicant to fix that so that when it comes before your commission, that it's something that's been vetted, it's been through various departments. Um, as stated in the video, we also rely upon other departments for expertise, engineering, public works, and, and such. And we really bring those all together for the commission to kind of look at. Um, with Reno, we really try to take an approach where we concisely put it together. You'll notice most of our staff reports are usually four to five pages. Um, that's the summary, and then we have those associated maps or other things to, to get you there. Um, the goal with that is really to concisely and simply uh, get the main points or highlights across for not just your commission, but for the public. So it's kind of easier to understand the issues and, and see what's, uh, what the proposal is in front of you. So um, with that, um, we really try to make that summary page, as they talked about in the video, um, highlighting, uh, as well as that motion, again, for both the Planning Commission, um, other staff, as well as the members of the public. And um, we're really making a conscious effort to go through and um, create those templates. Um, you may have noticed that with a lot of the reviews on um, some of the more recent projects, um, the sections and um, the writing and even some of our tables um, probably are appearing more consistent between items. Um, I know some of the commissioners have been around for a while, and, and so we, we actively uh, seek but appreciate input from the commission if there's any kind of comments or things that you would like to see or any ideas that you'd like us to incorporate in the future or things that you're just missing. We'd be happy to kind of look at our process and incorporate that. So um, as they mentioned in the video, we're, you know, we heavily rely on that master plan. That's our guiding document. Um, and then we kind of look at Title 18 and how that all fits in and the proposal before us. So um, thank you for taking the time to listen to the little spiel I just did and also the video. But if the commission has any comments, we're open to hear. So, or discussion items. Oh, thank you for, for sharing with us. <clears throat> I have a question. Um, has staff ever considered including uh, potential conditions that are responsive to either things the applicant is asking for or things the opposition is arguing? just so they're already there for consideration? Have you seen that? Is that, are there pitfalls to that? It, and frequently as a project planner, uh, when our planning staff is meeting with the applicants or meeting with concerned citizens, we try to vet out some of those issues or concerns. And so the answer is to yes to that a lot of the times. We'll try to either have mitigations or conditions of, of approval that have been drafted for your commission, or at least have some type of solution. Um, sometimes it works out where it comes up at the meeting and, and we try to work with that as is. But for the most part, when it comes to your commission, depending on the project, we try to have uh, a lot of the issues or concerns at least addressed or mitigated. So otherwise you would see um, kind of a different perspective or stance from um, staff. That's also why you see a lot of the uh, motions that we have uh, presented to you for your um, or recommend, or sorry, recommendations for motions. Um, from the, the staff perspective, we've worked through a lot of the issues, so you'll see it um, in support of a proposal because we've worked towards some of those um, mitigations or other things like that. Um, in some circumstances, if it truly is a project that just doesn't work, um, it usually doesn't come before your commission. So sometimes it's withdrawn, or sometimes it's it just doesn't come back to the table. So. The commission doesn't see those projects, um, so we might actually get in a number of applications, but again, we try to really work with the applicant. And I just want to reinforce that, you know, we're there to help educate uh, the public, uh, not just the applicants, but also concerned citizens on Title 18. So a little bit of a longer answer, but hopefully that covered the highlights of your question. And then um, at a lot of meetings, I feel like there's not a lot of meetings. Sometimes in meetings we have a lot of folks that have, might be in opposition, 
usually it's an opposition. Um, and then they sometimes might be confused about the process. And I noticed, I think it was at the last meeting, I remember the one before, uh, I think Joey went and talked to them to kind of help them understand or maybe find stuff on the internet. Is is that standard practice if you have a bunch of folks that may be uh, – is that standard practice to try to reach out to folks after the meeting, to try to help them or at the meeting, or is there a way to do that? Um, t typically, uh, typically our planners will follow up um, to help educate people on the process. So it, it really depends on the questions that kind of come across our desk. Um, sometimes we have to refer people on to another agency or something of that matter. But, but yes, we're here as a, a, a tool to help out our citizens, um, to help out our commissioners. And so we're happy to help um, direct people or clarify things or get people the information they need. So... Great. Well, thank you so much. Yep. Okay, we're on to agenda item number seven, which is the Truckee Meadows Regional Planning Liaison Report. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Commissioner Johnson, there is a Truckee Meadows Regional Planning meeting tomorrow night. Uh, and the only highlight I have for that is that I will be wearing a different Christmas sweater to that meeting than I am to this one. <laughs> we expect a report back as to what that sweater was at the next meeting. Uh, staff announcements, number agenda item number eight. Uh, thank you. Again, Jason Garcia Labu, planning manager. Just real quick, um, our next uh, planning commission meeting on January 4th, it looks like we have five items on the agenda. Um, and then uh, January is looking pretty busy. Uh, tentatively, we also have six to seven items on the January 18th meeting. So, we've got a lot of projects in the system. And again, uh, just to follow up on that January 18th meeting, we are um, planning on having that annexation conversation to discuss and answer questions uh, for the commission and uh, if anybody from the public has any comments on that. Um, with that, uh, City Council on the December 14th agenda, uh, they approved the Highland and Sierra Senior Care PUD projects and the Hogue Road project was continued. So that's all the updates on staff's end but if there's any questions or comments or ideas or concerns, please let me know. Uh, thank you. Agenda item number nine, commissioner suggestions for future agenda items. Okay, we'll close number nine. Uh, item number 10, public comments. We'll open public comments. Do we have any requests to speak forms, voicemails, et cetera? Not for this item. Okay. No one is in the, would anyone in the public like to speak? Seeing none, we'll close public comment. Uh, and if there's a motion for adjournment, seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, great. Thank you. And